Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello and welcome with me today to share the 10 best spiritual books that inspired her the most on her life journey is healer, teacher and naturopath Rebecca O'Reilly. A certified holistic nutritionist, Rebecca has been studying food, natural medicine and spiritual healing over many, many years. And she combines her background in science and natural medicine to empower people to overcome chronic and mystery illness and heal naturally using their food as medicine. Rebecca O'Reilly, welcome. Hi, Sandy. Such a, such a joy and a privilege and an honour to be here. So thank you. Well, thank you for joining us, Rebecca. So let's start with your childhood. You've had a deep affinity with nature all your life, haven't you? I have from a very early age, a big, big plant lover, big nature lover. Um, and yeah, I think this really began with my grandmother's influence more than anybody else. She was a really wonderful cook and um, I learned how to make Victoria sponge cake, a sort of quintessentially English um cake at a very young age and I was totally taken by it I would pull everything out of the kitchen and smother the kitchen in a total mess and make Victoria sponge cake on a regular basis so that was the first sort of real connection that I remember with food and then we also spent a lot of time at a at our cottage which was outside of Dublin where I grew up and um spent a lot of time in nature there with animals and the forest and beaches and all that sort of thing so so nature really stepped in at that time in my life mm. so tell me um what were you what did you get from nature what was the feeling you used to get when you were out there in the fields freedom and freedom. and that has just been the sort of the you know the peace for me ever since you know my it's been my I think my whole journey has been my quest for freedom in one way or another. And that was the, that was the feeling. Yeah, absolutely. You, are you talking about the freedom to do as you please, the freedom to be where you please? I think it's more the freedom inside, you know, when, when you have that feeling of being free within yourself. And I think when I'm in nature, it, 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 no matter what's going on in my life, no matter how chaotic life may be, it's that feeling of being free inside. Mm. And, and that's what that's what nature gives, you know, an opportunity you, to experience that. Yeah. Were you an avid reader as a child? I was an avid reader. Yeah, we, we were surrounded by books. We were a family that were surrounded by books. So I did a lot of reading. Um, and, you know, a lot of my reading would have been nature orientated as well. You know, I loved I loved books like uh, Watership Down and Secret Garden, for example. Um, I also loved all the Roald Dahl books, which are less nature orientated, but a bit, a bit sort of, um, uh, yeah, there's more humor, isn't there? There's a kind of mischievousness in, in those books that I loved. Yeah. At what point did you realize that you wanted to combine your love of food with your love of nature and make it a career? It came later, I have to say. It came in my 20s when I was going through a very hard time with my health. So the health piece for me has been from, from very early on in childhood. I started um, suffering with chronic asthma at the age of two and a half. So I was in and out of hospital a lot. It was pretty serious when I was younger. Um, but I was very resilient and sort of rode that wave well. And it didn't stop me from doing anything. Um, but then in my early 20s, after a, a relationship breakup with a guy who I fell totally madly in love with, um, the breakup of that relationship was so severe. It was such a, 
um, it was such a shock to my body and it was the awakening of a whole other realm of symptoms that I had never experienced before. So I had grown out of the asthma at that stage. Um, but when I went through that breakup, I started suffering with all sorts of symptoms from uh, gut problems to skin issues to, you know, hormonal ups and downs. My menstrual cycle stopped, you know, which is not unusual when somebody goes through a lot of shock and trauma. But but it went on and it then sort of led to there being other hormonal stuff underneath. And, and all of this I now understand to be viral. You know, my body was and 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 that's a piece that that went way back to childhood it's it's just that it was it was reawakened in my early 20s as a result of that grief and that shock which is often what happens when when we go through a crisis like that it can awaken dormant viruses in the body and create an explosion of health of health symptoms and for some people that can be so severe that they can't get out of bed the next day you know it's it's like a it's like an over an overnight deterioration of muscle function, for example. Um, whereas for me, it was sort of it was it was bits and pieces over a more prolonged period of time, um, and I and and so it led me on a journey of of searching for answers, and I was seeing a lot of doctors at that time, um, and it 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 was just such a nightmare. I decided that 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 no more. I couldn't I couldn't deal with any more doctors and sort of the the separation of answers you know there was nothing holistic you know there were no holistic solutions being given to me so at, at a certain point I made a very firm decision that I wanted to do it my way and to do it naturally and I suppose that's when you know food and nature started to step in again in a whole different way and and started to take me down a different path. Mm. Well, we'll come back to this a little bit later. Let's have a look at your books. I mean, some of them uh, definitely have to do with nature uh, and food and others um, are more spiritual yeah. in a different way. Um, is your list chronological? The order that you gave it to me, is that uh, the order you read them? It is. It is because it sort of tracks the, the journey that I was on you know, okay. and, and one sort of one led to the next in terms of my life path, I guess, you know, yeah. And I have to ask, did you have a real challenge distilling your list down to 10 or did you find it easy? I, it was challenging to distill it down to 10. It, it, it was. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny when you come back to these things, when I was sort of going back through the list, I was thinking, why on earth did I pick that one over this one, you know? And and what was really interesting was that actually in that list, there was very few food books, you know? It was much more sort of, um, you know, of, of the, the spirituality aspect was coming through much more in the list. And I don't know why that was, but those were the books that came at the time of me sitting down to do this. And, um, and, and, and they've all played a huge role you know, they've all played a part in the journey. So it was just meant to be. Mm. Okay, well, your first book has been described as perhaps the most important book yet written on meditation and the process of inner transformation. And it is A Path with Heart, a guide through the perils and promises of spiritual life by Jack Cornfield. That was published in 1993. When did you read it? I read it, so I would have been in my early 20s, which would have been 2004, maybe, time-ish, around that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it had a really big effect on me, that book. So I, I wasn't long, you know, coming out of that breakup and life was really messy at that time. I was all over the place. And um, I, you know, I that 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 sort of, that breakup in my life really propelled me onto a different path. It was it was an awakening, there's no question, and a very profound, you know, uh, sharp awakening onto the path that I needed to be on. But obviously I didn't realise it at that time. So it sort of propelled me to start looking for answers in, in a different direction. And and that book's I I don't I don't even know how it came into my hands. I can't remember, but it did. And it really started to open the doors of meditation and, you know, how we could lead a more um, 
a, a more spiritual life, foca focusing inwards rather than focusing outwards. Um, and I think there was a there was a there was a gentleness to it that really uh, had a calming influence. And it was then from from reading that book that I started going off on silent meditation retreats for sort of seven to ten days at a time at a Buddhist monastery in Hertfordshire called Amaravati. And I did that over several Christmases and New Year's. I would go and just sit in silence and I just loved it. So it really had a profound effect, that book. Yeah. Mm. Your second book is the book of macrobiotics, The Universal Way of Health, Happiness and Peace by Michio Kushi. 2012, that was published. What was it about macrobiotics? Yeah, this is this is a funny one because macrobiotics has such a, you know, um, I don't know, a bad rap in the world today in a way. Um, but actually, it's it's, you know, there's so much more to it. And and I came across macrobiotics. I was I was um, doing a cookery course in Ireland at Ballymaloo Cookery School, which was an amazing opportunity over 12 weeks and um, something I'd wanted to do since early in my life. Um, but at that time, you know, on uh, at this gorgeous cookery school in in the countryside in Ireland, where we were eating loads of dairy from the Jersey cows and homemade butter and all sorts of delicious things, but my health symptoms were just firing left, right, and centre. And it was very confusing because I just didn't understand what was going on in my body. But in the final days of that twelve week course. This, one, this this macrobiotic chef came to give a talk and it was so, you know, it was so out of place in a way for, for where I was and what we were doing. But I think one of the girls who was on the course had organized for this woman to come in. And there was only about eight of us who went to listen to her. And she she just blew me away because she started talking about our relationship to food and nature in a whole different way. And she was actually cooking for she was a, she was quite a well-known macrobiotic chef who was cooking for celebrities around the world at that stage and I just thought wow what what a life this woman is living but it's so um it's so heart-centered and it's so uh, different to what I what I have been learning you know um so I was quite taken with it and then I went off and started researching macrobiotics which I'd never heard of and I came across um, the International School of Macrobiotics in Devon, which is run by um, Oliver Cowmeadow, who became one of my first teachers and he and a very profound teacher at that. So I went off and I studied with Oliver for two years in Devon and I learned so much, but not just about food and healing and how we can um, uh, you know, how we can use this approach to advance our health. It was so much more. It was a whole philosophy by which we can understand the world. So macrobiotics is really based in the teachings of the order of the universe, you know, the order of the universe, the, the law of God, the eternal principles of change by which our world functions, which has been the basis for you know, many of the great religions across the world, Buddhism, Taoism, Christianity, Judaism, for example, that's sort of the common thread that ties all these religions together. And in the ancient Hellenistic world, the, the macrobiotics was the term that was used to teach people about the order of the universe. And it was first coined by Hippocrates back in five, in the, in the fifth century BC, and, macro, um, and uh, Hippocrates was himself teaching a natural approach to eating and living. So it was all about how we're living in harmony in, you know, with our environment. And we need to do that through an understanding of the order of the universe. So macrobios is a, is a Greek word that means great life or long life. So, it, it, so that's where it came from, which is so fascinating. And then in the in the East, the the um, you know the order of the universe is understood through the principles of of yin and yang, which are the two complementary and opposing forces. And that really influences macrobiotics and the philosophy of macrobiotics. But 
macrobiotics was then taken on, the teachings were taken on by a Japanese man called George Asawa and then Michio Kushi, who wrote this book. So it, it sort of took on a more Japanese influence, if you like, and that's how it's become more known today. But it, it, but it has somehow shrunk into being known for, you know, for its, you know, strictness of regime with um, brown rice and vegetables. But actually, it's, it's an entire philosophy. So I think it's important to understand that and put some context to it, because for me, it was really it, it blew me open, you know, um, it was a it was a step beyond the path the path with heart book. It was it was like suddenly I was understanding the religions of the world and and you know our place in that and how that relates to food and nature and our environment. So it was it was a big influence in my life and it's a very beautiful book. Did you immediately change your diet? I did. I did. I, I can never say I was, in, you know, entirely macrobiotic per se, um, but I absolutely did change my diet. And the macrobiotic principles are very much based around, uh, you know, a diet that is full of fruits and vegetables and whole grains, but that is very low in fat. And that has been one of the guiding principles since way back, since Hippocrates and beyond. And that's still the principle, the principle of eating, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables with very low fat, not so much the grain part now in the modern world. Um, but that would still influence how I that I mean, that's just how I eat today. And that's how I would teach other people to eat, because it is the path to longevity that has been understood since since that time of Hippocrates. Mm. Wow. So it doesn't go well with the keto diet then? <laughs> it is so far from the keto diet. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there's in the health world today, there, there's very much two approaches that are that are sort of um, present, if you like. One is the high fat, high protein, low carbohydrate approach. And the other is the low carbohydrate, high carbohydrate, low fat approach. But if we look at studies that date way back, you know, to the 1920s, for example, the the path to longevity, the path that looks after our organs in the longer term is a high carbohydrate, low fat approach that the healers have been teaching since time began. So, you know, and, and for me, that's experiential. You know, I've experienced that through my body and and I think I've probably tried every single approach there is. To, to, to gain my health back over the years. And that's the approach that I have found really works for me. Mm. Yeah. Well, book number three is quite different. It is Anatomy of the Spirit. We've looked at the body, now we're going to the spirit. The Seven Stages of Power and Healing by Caroline Mace. Um, very, very popular book indeed. A very popular book. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and it is quite different. And yet it sort of brings us you know back to the body again but also also to the spirit um and and this book was really a sort of introduction you know for me into energy medicine um and and how we can how we can sort of look to energy medicine as a guide to healing and again what's beautiful about this book is that it 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 incorporates the teachings of different religions, in particular um, Hinduism, Christianity and Judaism, um, because each of those religions have the have, have teachings that in Hindu, it's the, it's the um, chakra system and Christianity, the seven sacraments. And in Judaism, there's the tree of life in the Kabbalah tradition. And so what what Caroline discovered was the crossover between these religions and and how they relate to the body. So we can use the teachings as a blueprint for our own healing. And it's I just find that so fascinating because because, again, we're back to the order of the universe. You know, it's 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 coming back to, for me to the same the same principle which is fascinating. Um, and this book is very much about our relationship to power and how our relationship to power informs our health, 
ultimately. Um, and I can see for me how true that is. You know, if things happen to us in our lives, then it affects certain power centers or energy centers of the body. And in a way, it's our, it's our job to discover which power centers have become disrupted and why. And then we can learn how to overcome the disruption and to take back our power in that part of the body. So this is where the chakra system is so, is so beautiful. Um, it's such a powerful way of working and learning how to be an intuitive. And to become more intuitive is to really grow your self-esteem and your power. And this is ultimately what creates our health. Yeah. yeah. So what was it that attracted you to that book? Was it the title? Did somebody recommend it to you? Was it a kind of natural progression? It, it was a natural progression. And I, I honestly can't remember if somebody recommended it to me. But when I look at the title alone, I know that it's a title that would jump out at me, yeah. you know? Yeah. An yeah. Anatomy of the Spirit. I mean... That's that just lights me up. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay, so book number four is Beyond the Veil by Guy Bergs. Yes, so Guy Bergs has been my meditation teacher for a very long time, since since my since my late twenties. And um it's such a beautiful book because it's his it's his story, but it's also it's also a bit of a manual, you know, it's his journey to awakening and how he met his teachers and, and the adventure that that took him on. Um, and it's such a heartfelt, open, um, beautiful story, you know, that has so many teachings in it. And when I read it, 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 it was like it opened a very deep longing in me just to go deeper. I just needed to go deeper. Um, and, you know, on and off over the years, I've been on that path of the Dharma with, with Berg. So he would have his, um, the, the roots of his teachings would be in, in Buddhism. And um, that's really the sort of, you know, it's been the pillar for me in terms of my, my spiritual practice, the, the path of the Dharma and learning from Berg's has been very much the pillar that I come back to time and time again, no matter how many rabbit holes I go down which have been many and I'm sure there'll be more to come I it's where I keep coming back to it's it's like it forms the you know the central pole that keeps keeps me steady yeah. yes there are as many rabbit holes as there are potholes in England and believe me there's a lot of potholes in England <laughs> there are a lot of potholes in England it's yeah. true yeah, national problem. Um, yeah. Book number five is uh, Soul Shaping, A Journey of Self-Creation by Jeff Brown. Lovely oh, book. I just love this book. Mm. It, really, it really spoke to me in so many ways. And um, it, it's deeply inspiring. You know, it, it, it really is. So, Yes, it's his story to finding his purpose in the madness of the world that we inhabit. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I think what really, what really grabbed me from this book is just how deeply we have to keep listening to ourselves <clears throat> in order to be able to navigate through the noise and the pressure that we're up against all the time. You know, and I think we live in a world that's very that traditionally has been very goal orientated, you know, very, very driven. And that makes it more difficult to find the quietness to listen to what it is you are here to do to find your own purpose. Mm -hmm. And certainly for me, you know, it comes back to the, the, the rabbit holes I've been pulled down you know, listening to other people, being directed by other people. It's, it requires the spirit of a warrior to keep coming back home to oneself and to keep listening deeply to what it is we need to be doing. And it's a courageous act, you know. Jeff's story is one of, of, of very great courage 
that I think needed to be shared because we need to hear that, you know, that it can be done. It is possible. Mm -hmm. And and when we do it, that's when the doors open and the gifts come. So, yeah, it, it's a very yeah. good book. Very inspiring. I mean, he it was his lifelong dream to practice uh, criminal law yeah. and search for the truth in the courtroom, I yeah. read. In fact, just as he was about to have his chance, something inside him said no. Mm. He ended up finding his truth in the school of heart Knox, he says, the school of life. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we all need to listen, don't we? Absolutely. Abs and, not, and not always easy. It's not always easy. Yeah. In fact, it's probably yeah. very hard, to, especially yeah. when all of his studies and everything in his life had been directed to that particular career. Absolutely. To say, no, I'm not going any further is huge. Yeah. Huge. It is. But like he said in the book, actually, you know, when, when he was sort of feeling the calling to write, it was there, there became a point where there, even though he was resisting it, there was no choice because he was having sleepless nights. And it was it was almost like, you know, spirit would not let him rest until he got writing. So if he wrote, he could sleep. If he didn't write, he couldn't sleep. You know, so it's it's interesting. So we have to look reflect on ourselves what what is it that keeps arising you know, is it a health issue is it insomnia is it what is it and what's it calling us to you know yeah yeah okay well we're going to take a short break now we'll be back in a few minutes with more of rebecca o'reilly's 10 best spiritual books stay tuned Om times tv Maya Angelou once said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and when I'm not hosting Om Times Media's flagship radio show, What Is Going On, and the No BS Spiritual Book Club, I help people share their untold stories. Books are my life, my joy, and my passion, and there is no greater reward than helping aspiring writers get their books out of their heads and into the hands of those who are waiting to read them. If you feel that you have a book in you, but don't know where to begin, visit sedgebeer.com, click on the Work With Me tab, and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you've been looking for. That's sedgebeer.com, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself. Invest in your brand and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Own Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Own Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Own Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Own Times. Open yourself to the possibilities. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back, Rebecca O'Reilly. Book number six on your list is Life Changing Foods by Anthony William, also known as The Medical Medium. Yes, yeah, so another another book that's hugely influenced my journey. So I was I was introduced to the medical medium work when I was giving a cookery class back in I think it was 2017. So not long after he'd written his first book, First of Eight. 
And um, there was a girl assisting me in the class who I hadn't met before. And she was sort of quiet and interesting. And I could tell she'd had some sort of a health journey. She just had that sense about her. But she came up to me at the end of the class and said, there's a book that I think you'd really, really enjoy that's hugely helped my healing. Um, And so she gave me the name of it and I went and ordered it and read it immediately. And it was his his first book, which is the secrets behind chronic and mystery illness and how to finally heal. And it was it was just incredible the effect that it had on me. It was like every single cell in my body was resonating with the words in this book because it was like all the missing pieces had suddenly been filled in. And, you know, I had come from a background of studying, you know, science at undergrad, at undergrad level, level. I'd gone to do, go on to do a master's, I had studied macrobiotics, I had all these pieces, but my health was still not where it should have been or, or could have been, should I say. And when I read that book, it, it, it was just immediate. So, so I very quickly started putting you know, the protocols that he was recommending in in place. And they had a big effect, there's no question. And I think what I loved about his work was the simplicity of it, because it was taking me back to what I had learned really through macrobiotics in many ways, you know, that fresh fruit and vegetables, herbs, spices, wild foods, these are the foods that are going to heal our health. Um, so it was the it was the food as medicine part coming back around in a very profound way, infused with the sacred. You know, there was no question for me that this work was coming from a much, much deeper place. Um, so life life changing foods, which was um, his second book, is is a is a very beautiful um, sort of uh, guide, if you like, to the top. 50 fruits and vegetables and the effect that they have not only physically but also spiritually and emotionally um so it's been a bit of a kitchen bible for me <coughs> from the start, and a very very powerful influence on my healing journey and also the work that i've done with clients um teaching people how to use food as medicine in a very simple way. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Many lives, many masters, the true story of a prominent psychiatrist, his young patient, and the past life therapy that changed both mm. their lives. Dr. Brian Weiss, and that is book number seven. And it's also another very popular book. It is. It is. Yeah. And I and I really did love this book. Um, and I think what what stood out for me was, you know, how a, a very traditional doctor was suddenly having his, you know, um, ways blown open, if you like, in a in a in a very unknown way to him. Mm. Um, and I and and it was a sort of you know, confirmation that there are doctors out there who are open to other ways and willing to, you know, present that within their professions, no matter what the cost. And the effect that it had on the client is, is, is all we really need. You know, it was, an experiential effect. And I think sometimes in the modern world, we lose the experiential aspect because we're so fixed on the science. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas, you know, for me on my journey, it's, it's the learning and the, you know, the deep learning doesn't come until I've experienced it through myself, through my body. Yeah. I think that's true of all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You can't really know it until you've got it in the muscle. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Were you new to the idea of reincarnation when you read that book or is, was it something that you yeah. had encountered before? Yeah, so so it was something I had, you know, absolutely encountered. So it wasn't a new concept. I think it was just the the the, the beauty of the story, really, you know, that, that was so, um, that captured me and I found so fascinating that there's all these different approaches that we can take to healing, you know, all these different modalities, hypnotherapy just being one of them. And actually, it doesn't really matter what the modality is. It's the way in which it comes through. You know, it's the, it's the, because it's coming from another place. It's, it's like we're, we have to be open to being, to be the channel ultimately with whatever we're doing. And he was obviously ready to be that channel, but unbeknownst to him until it happened. So, yeah. Did you, did it give you any thoughts about um, your health and uh, as being something uh, from a past life? Absolutely. I mean, you know, but that that's, you know, something, I, I mean, I think that there's so many reasons why we get sick. It's not just, it's not so simple as it just being, you know, what we're simply exposed to in this world that, you know, we're, we're exposed to things in this world that don't support our health for sure. But often it's triggering parts of our body that need deeper attention mm -hmm. there's no question and you know that is influenced by not only this lifetime but many lifetimes in in my view yeah and mm -hmm. that's the journey really you know it's the journey it's the journey back home that's where it's calling us is mm -hmm. back home to ourselves yeah. Yeah. Book number eight, another popular book, is The Untethered Soul, The Journey Beyond Yourself by Michael Singer. Yes. And this this book I find so refreshing. I find it so uplifting and inspiring. And what's lovely is having the influence of different teachers, you know, how how Michael is bringing the teachings is different to how I've learned the teachings from Bergs, for example. And sometimes it's really important to have these different influences and, and different teachers because they bring a different perspective. Um, and I read The Untethered Soul twice, actually, only a few months apart. And both times it gave me something completely different. Um, but I think I think it was the the, you know, the refreshingness, refreshness of it that I enjoyed so much. And again, this thread of freedom, you know, it's, it, it, it is run through that book. Um, it, there's a big focus on how we create our freedom. And I think for me, that's, that's the ongoing piece. How do we create our freedom more and more? You know, that's, mm. that's what I'm here to do is to create my freedom. Yeah. And to support other people to do the same. Yeah. Mm. Book number nine is a new one on me. Never heard of it before. Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teachings of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Yeah, so we're back back to the food a little bit more with this one. And um, this is a very, very beautiful book that I only only read last summer, actually. And, um, oh, it's, it's, you know, the magic in this book comes from her um, respect, I think, for our earth, for our land, for how we grow our food and for the spirit that lives in the food that we eat. Mm. And so, you know, how we're cultivating our food how we're picking our food the whole process that's involved with food has become so brutalized in a way and we've come so far away from what indigenous people were once doing and teaching and 
she really brings that back to life in this book. You know, there's such a um, there's such a, a a deep teaching of reciprocity with the land. Um, and she's a very inspiring woman. So she comes from the, um, if I can say it correctly, the Potawatomi indigenous peoples. That's her sort of, that's her heritage. Um, and so the sense of her heritage runs through everything that she does so strongly. And I think we've, we've really lost that. You know, we've we've lost that sense of our lineage and how things were once done, you know, unless you've been brought up with that, unless it's really run through your family line. Mm. And with her, it really has. And she brings that to the world in a very beautiful way. So there's many, many teachings in that book around how we work with plants, how we eat food, how we treat ourselves in relation to food and plants um and she's a scientist so she's weaving together you know her background in in science with this sort of storytelling and and a deep sense of spirit yeah mm -hmm. Do, are you familiar with the work of, you probably are western price yes yeah Absolutely. Yeah, what, you know, I mean, that made a big impact on me because everything he says makes so much sense. And for those who don't know, he was a dentist and he did travel around the world and he was looking at people's mouths and jaws and um, also their diets. And he was probably one of the first people to say that you should eat local, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, how much he has seen uh, people's jaws, mouths, teeth. Yeah and health suffer or they have a diet that is foreign to them uh, absolutely absolutely and again there's you know there's big crossovers here with you know going back going back to what hippocrates was teaching going back to the macrobiotics approach going back to what anthony williams is teaching you know this this simplicity of um learning learning how to work with food in its natural form they're all really saying the same thing, but we've but we've wandered so far from that place that it's almost foreign to us. You know, it's foreign to eat a simple diet. It's foreign to, you know, to rely on plants the way we once did and to understand how to be in a reciprocal relationship with plants so that it does harness health. So yeah yeah it's interesting times with with food and health i think they are two very very big topics and um, Massive topics yeah. yeah 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 and i think yeah. you know so many of us do wonder when we see raspberries on sale out of season in our local supermarket whether you know should we really be eating that i mean most of them have lost any taste that they used to have um and uh, i i do think that we're really doing ourselves a lot of harm yeah we we are which i suppose is why there's you know there i mean and there is more and more sort of grassroots growing community growing happening now and and mm. um you know people more inspired to grow their own food because there's no question you know when you grow things in your back garden whether it's just some herbs in a pot you're getting all the microorganisms that are on that yeah. food. And it's those microorganisms that ultimately help to create your health, you know? Yeah. So when things are highly processed and in plastic and in a supermarket, they've, you know, you lose that aspect. You do. And, and already our, you know, soils and the earth is in such poor condition a lot of the time. So nutrient quality is not what it was mm. once upon a time so we mm. really need all the nutrient we can get um by learning how to eat more food from local markets from our gardens you know from community growing um there's no question yeah yeah 
Well, let's move on to the last book on your list, and I'm probably going to get my pronunciation very wrong, but I'll give a a go. The book is Womb Wisdom, Awakening the Creative and Forgotten Powers of the Feminine by Padma and Anaya Ion Pakasha. Pakasha. Yeah, that's as 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 well as I would say it, Sandy. So, yeah, sounds good. So you said that you were gifted this book following a plant medicine journey. Yes, I was. I was, and what a beautiful gift it was. And really, you know, the the sort of um, the womb work is not new to me, especially with all the sort of health issues that I've had. Um, losing my menstrual cycle in my early 20s took me on quite a big journey with with my um you know whole reproductive health and it's only in more recent times that I've really come to realize the 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 sort of importance of the womb in that in that in that journey you know and I think what's beautiful about this book is that it's really highlighting the where we are in the world today in terms of the disconnection from our bodies and in particular the disconnect from our wombs as women and actually that the that that the healing that is required in the world both for men and women is for a deeper connection to the womb and to the body so this book again is very much based on various teachings from India, Tibet, um, Christianity, Judaism. Um, so back to the same old theme for me, you know, which is such a, it's such a fascination. Um, and these teachings of the womb that have been around for so long, you know, that have been lost for so long, and I think are really gaining prominence again with, the awakening of the feminine, you know, and the harmonizing, equalizing of the masculine and the feminine in the world. Um, and, you know, the the awakening of the, the womb and this connection to our bodies is not just about women, because the more connected women are to their wombs and to their bodies, the more it supports the masculine. So it's it's a creation of harmony rather than it being this rise of the women only. You know, it's much more about creating harmony now. Um, and also what what's important about this book is is that it helped me to see very clearly how trauma in our lives affects us at such a such a profound level that can take years and years and years to unravel. So for me, there was abuse that happened as a child that I only started having memories of much, much later. And part of the ceremony that I did was to reconnect with, to really gain an understanding and reconnect with what happened so that I could, so that I could get a sense of it in my body. And it, you know, things arise in the body on a physical level in order to show us, to guide us back to something that needs opening, that needs healing, that needs responding to. Um, but I think often in the modern world, it, it, it can drive people the other way. It can drive people out of the body rather than into the body. And actually, the journey is to come into the body. So, yes, so it was a it was a beautiful gift to be given this book and um, very much a highlight of of what we're experiencing in the world today. Yeah. Well, that's your 10 best uh, list of books. Tell us a little bit about how you work, Um, because you do a lot of remote work with people over the Internet. How are you guiding people through courses to do with food, you know, remotely? Yeah. Um, Well, my, as you know, my passion really is teaching people how to use food as medicine to heal their health and teaching people how to really create a connection to their bodies and to the food that they're eating. So 
ultimately what I'm doing is teaching them, you know, specific protocols that they can bring in in order to serve a particular function. And that's where the medical medium work has had such a, a big influence because we're living in a world where we're exposed to a lot of pathogenic activity and heavy metals and herbicides and pesticides and all of that sort of thing that he has really brought to the forefront, I feel, in a, in a, in a more prominent way. And there's specific food combinations that we can use in order to move some of this stuff out of the body. So that's one aspect, you know, is teaching people how to actually use specific foods and bring them together to create recipes, to work in their kitchen every day using teas, you know, um, using using tinctures, using herbs and supplements, um, um, but also the cooking aspect. So it's it's about getting people in the kitchen and using their hands. And that's something that I'm I'm, you know, is such an important part of healing is the taking responsibility. You know, a lot of people just want the quick fix, but that's not what healing is all about. Healing mm. is really learning and taking the responsibility to do this yourself and take the time to do it at home. So I'm teaching people that part. And then through that, I'm teaching them how to reconnect with the food that they're eating and then in turn with their bodies because we've become so disassociated from the body and food is a very very tangible way to get us back in touch with ourselves because our you know the way in which we eat is really a direct reflection of our relationship to self so how we are treating food and how we are eating food preparing food is just that practice is very a very very profound insight into what sort of relationship one has with themselves mm. and it's the journey back home learning to work with for me learning to work with food in this way is teaching you how to come back home to yourself and to your body and to nature it must be um quite eye-opening for people to hear i mean you know heavy metals a lot of people suffer from heavy metals and usually you know it's collation therapy or something like that but to actually hear that you can move those metals out of your body with certain foods must come as quite a surprise to people it does and and also the whole heavy metals piece you know many people don't understand that that's a new piece and heavy metals have such a huge huge role to play in our health and especially our mental health and again it's experiential you know when you start working with these protocols to move heavy metals out you can only really know what's happening as a result of symptoms starting to change in your body that's mm. that's that's when you know um and when i look back you know on, on my journey, there's, there's been huge changes in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of heavy metal removal and, and what I've, you know, what I only subsequently came to know, you know, with regards to the ways in which heavy metals affect us, certain symptoms that I would have been suffering from that, that I didn't realize were as a result of heavy metal, you know, too many heavy metals in my body, in my brain. So it was only by using these protocols and really learning how to clear out my body on a deeper level that I started experience, experiencing relief from this approach, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. One of the biggest um, problems we have today um, is, is obesity in children. Mm. And, you know, I listened to the British government and all of the you know things that they say they are doing to uh, address this issue um and yet we never hear from them we are going to start monitoring the preservatives and the e numbers and all of the things that go into food that is being sold to families these days um what do you think one can do about that you know i mean Oh, You've got to feed your kids, Andy. you know. 
Uh, absolutely, it goes back to the kids. There's no question. But, you know, it 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 goes back to educating pregnant mothers because the imprint for obesity is actually laid during pregnancy. Mm. So, you know, there's many studies now to show that those fat cells in a child are actually are actually, um, you know, coming from the womb. So, you know, it comes back to education and it comes back to us really um, getting word out there as much as possible to people about how we can live and eat for health. But there's such a battle all the time because we're up against some of the biggest industries in the world. Oh, yes. So, you know, there's no there's no easy solution to this. And I don't I don't have one simple answer other than to keep educating people. You know, my I suppose in my practice, my you know, my specialty is working with people with chronic symptoms and conditions. And it's often through somebody having a journey with their health that they come to learn how to actually eat and how to live for health but otherwise had they not have experienced those symptoms they wouldn't necessarily have gone down this path and when i'm working with a mother for example i'm really teaching her not only how to heal her own health but how to heal the health of her whole family it's so important you know and i really bring that into the conversation because empowering moms you know in in the family unit is absolutely critical to this whole, you know, changing, this whole change that needs to happen. Do you think that some of these um, really large, uh, you know, food conglomerates um, should be made to be more accountable? Because, you know, we get these fads, we get, oh, you know, everybody, you can eat this and it's good for your heart. And then it's like, oh, no, you shouldn't be eating that after all. You should be eating this instead. Meantime, millions of people have been following those guidelines and suffering for it. And yet they seem to do it with impunity. Yeah, there's no question, Sandy. I mean, there is no question that they should be held to account. You know, I mean, if it, I mean, it, you know, between between the pharmaceutical industry and the food industry, it's, you know, we're talking about the biggest powers in the world. Yes. And there is no question that they need to be held to account. But how do we do it? Because very often the people who are really speaking out are really up against it. Mm. They are really well, up against it. It's it's up to the governments, really. They you know there should be uh, some accountability. They should find them. You know if they're going to stuff ideas down people's you know throats literally because with the advertising that they do and all of the cheap foods that they make and try to convince the kids and very successfully that these are the things that they, you know, want to eat yeah. um, for various different reasons, then they have to be fined. They must be fined. They yeah. must be, Sandy. They must be. Yeah. I mean, you know, I whether, whether it'll happen or not, I have no idea. And yeah, I well, I suppose it comes back to the people. It comes yeah. back. It does. We are the ones that have to create the change. The parents have to make sure that they avoid some of these things so that they they aren't successful anymore. They don't Absolutely. make money anymore. Which, which is why I am so driven and passionate to talk about this. You know, it's really, it's really, really important in the world that we live in that people understand, you know, how food works and how it can work for us yeah. and, against us. and, and against, against us and against us and against us but you know really learning the principles and it's going all these fads and trends that keep coming around it, it, it you have to have a really um you have to really learn to see through what keeps coming yeah. and the way in which i've learned to see through is to keep going back to the simplicity fruits, vegetables, herbs, spices, wild foods, plants. These are the foods that inform our health. Yeah. You know? I'm afraid we're out of time now, Rebecca, so we're going to have to leave it here. But I want to thank you for adding your 10 best list of spiritual books to 
the No BS Spiritual Book Club's library of recommendations. Thank you. You're very welcome, Sandy, and thank you so much for having me on your show. It's been really a really beautiful you, experience. You can learn more about Rebecca's work. You can sign up for her newsletter, which is really good. Uh, lots of great information that she shares at her website, which is Rebecca hyphen O'Reilly, no apostrophe, O'Reilly.com. Rebecca hyphen O'Reilly.com. That's it for this week. Um, I'll be back at the same time next week with another uh, 10 best interview for the No BS Spiritual Book Club. Till then, it's goodbye from me. And thank you again to Rebecca O'Reilly. Thank you, Sandy.